So thank you so much for coming today and joining us in this talk. My name is Hassan. I'm Secretary of Science, Chapter IGI. And today we have a talk uh, by Dr. Cross. Uh, Dr. Cross uh, joined uh, last fall, right, 2014, IUPI. Uh, and he's building uh, actual science program at IUPI. Uh, he was senior actual analyst at Senior Whole Health in Boston. Boston. And he was faculty member at IUPI 2007, 2004, right? Uh, he got his undergrad in applied math from uh, California Institute of Technology, and he got his master from in math mathematics uh, from the University of Chicago, and he does a PhD uh, in operation research at the University of Michigan. Right. But uh, everything to say that here we have a mathematician, and the reason is uh, he passed all his ASA exam uh, with a score of ten. He's been full of Society of Assuries since 2004. He's, uh, he taught uh, gifted students at Duke University for nine years, and he's a silver medalist in International Math Olympiad. Sorry, John? You left out Pudman Fellow, but I'm impressed you got that much information. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you again, and welcome. All right. I, I've seen many familiar faces. I'm curious if the, the ones who are not familiar, are you uh, looking to join the actuarial program at some point? Okay. So, what's an actuary? In summary, one sentence, an actuary is a business professional who, use math, who uses mathematical models to evaluate processes. Now, one sentence has a lot of meaning behind it. Let's break it down. So, First of all, business professional. It's very different from the academic world. Your focus is on the company. When you're an academic, when you are in an academic environment, uh, you've got a lot of choices about what you want to research. An insurance company might not care about one particular enzyme that might matter for curing cancer. They're interested in knowing about a population of 100,000 people, how many of them are likely to get it. So the types of problems you need to work on are driven by business issues. Their methodology, you may think you've got a beautiful model that's better than what exists, but you're going to have to convince the industry to change its standards before you can use it. But, uh, tools, they're actually the company specifications. Everyone uses Microsoft Excel or Lotus. Everybody uses such and such database program. The nice thing is that everyone can share work more easily. The, the downside is, of course, you don't have the flexibility you might like to pick and choose what you're going to use. Uh, regulations can affect your conclusions. Uh, just prices. The, there are very broad regulations that says that insurance prices need to be adequate, not excessive, and not unfairly discriminatory. And a perfect example that uh, my boss and I used as a toy problem was people with blue versus brown eyes driving on the road. Is there an argument that one is a safer driver than the other? And even if so, you're not going to be able to get that past regulators. And then, of course, deadlines. You generally don't have time to get everything perfect, as, at least as much as you'd like. It's important that it gets done. Uh, one particular example was a neat little rush job uh, on non-catastrophic models. I want to intersperse some actual models that I've done so you can see the sort of math that's, that I've had to come up with on the fly. So one of our reinsurers asked about coming up with a probability density function for our annual home insurance losses. So I looked at that and I said, well, we have, let's change the color, 48 months of good data to use. So I made some assumptions, just a quick and dirty model. I said, well, let's assume that months of damage are independent. Yes, a bad winter in January is probably going to carry over to a bad winter in February. So, January loss ratio, 83%, 75%, 60%, 72%, 
February, and so on through December. This is the data I had available. Our premiums over that time period and claims over that time period. So I basically treated each month as a four-sided die. Wrote a program in Microsoft Excel to make the uh, convolution of that function for each different column 12 times. And that was what we submitted to our reinsurer as a final result. Uh, because of a bad January, one year, it actually looked kind of bimodal. Uh, most of the weight was over here with the three good, three not so bad Januarys. There's never a good January in Boston. And uh, this was a really bad one. So, an actuary uses mathematical models. Now, I've shown you one example already. But that leads to the obvious question, what's a model? Well, this is something many of you have heard me say. Obviously, it's my opinion. But I think the best way to summarize the term model is that a model is a compromise between simplicity and reality. And I've got a good example that you're all familiar with. I'd like a show of hands. How many people believe that the Earth revolves around the sun? All right. Now, if you've taken physics, you know that that's a good model. But actually, in the strictest sense, the Earth revolves around the center of mass of the solar system, right? The sun's a big thing. But so are Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And it turns out they've got enough mass that unless they're more or less opposite, the center of mass shifts. And as a matter of fact, the center of mass of the solar system is only within the sun about 38% of the time. But as a model, saying that the Earth revolves around the sun is a good approximation to reality, right? If you're trying to launch a space probe, you might want something a little better. But it's a good start. Now, uh, simplicity is not just important from a practical standpoint. It's actually important from a theoretical standpoint. If you've taken statistics, uh, you may have heard about degrees of freedom, significance factors. If you come up with this beautiful 10-parameter model, but the sum square error, a measure of the model fit, isn't much better than a two-parameter model, you can't justify it on a theoretical basis. And more importantly, in the business world, you can't explain it as well on a practical basis. In particular, as an actuary, you're going to be dealing with non-mathematical audiences frequently. You deal with underwriters, people who write the policies. You deal with insurance agents who sell the policies. And you've got to be able not just to show your work and come up with the right answer, you've got to be able to explain it effectively. And the fact of the matter is, when you're dealing with reality, you have all sorts of problems too. The data might not agree with what you think ought to be happening, or even what, more importantly, your boss thinks ought to be happening. And the data can have a lot of noise in them. There can be bad data. One example, again, this is from another thing that popped up on the job. Um, I'll, I'll get to a slide to draw in a moment. But, we, when I was at Conseco, we insured long-term care claims. So if someone was in, the, was in the nursing home, they'd get a check. And the problem was there was a bit of a disconnect between the company and the group processing the claims. Conseco grew in the uh, 90s and 2000s by buying other companies. And so a lot of times trying to mesh different systems was problematic. So one thing we wanted to know is, if someone in a nursing home hasn't gotten a check for a couple months, are they actually out of the nursing home? Did they get better? Did they die? Do we have to hold a reserve for future expenses? So I overheard uh, my boss's boss asking my boss about this. I was walking with something else. I said, well, that sounds like a, a simple Markov matrix model. And uh, I got two blank stares in response. 
so I explained what I was talking about, and they said, yeah, that sounds great. So, for those of you not familiar, basically what I was looking at is the amount of time since a check had been cut, and the probability that if someone has a check in the most recent month, are they healthy or dead? Now, do we have to worry about the future? If they haven't had a check for four months, are they healthy or dead? Do we have to worry about the future? And so typically, if I look at month-to-month -month data, I would expect two things to happen. First of all, if they don't get a check, then the next month is going to be one month later, right? One month more since the last check. On the other hand, if they do get a check, they're going to reset to zero. And if they don't get a check for more than six months, we're going to assume they're dead, they got better, we don't have to hold a reserve for their illness anymore. So, at this point, you think it's a simple matter. Write a few SQL queries, download the data, and plug it into a Markov matrix, which will look something like, I'm actually eliminating the infinity stage for the moment. cells that should be populated are the ones that represent an error, from 0 to 1, 1 to 2, or from anything to 0. What I found in practice was I had some claims that in January they hadn't gotten a check for one month, and then in February they hadn't gotten a check for one month. I had all sorts, just a few policies here and there. But still enough to recognize that somewhere the computer was the calculation being made to determine how many months since the check had been cut, and the function was broken. It wasn't quite working. That said, again, I had to come up with an answer. So I just sort of said, all right, we're just going to assign these points to what seems most logical. And I explained to my boss what I was doing and why. He was fine with it. But you've got to deal with bad data every now and again. At some companies, the data is a lot worse. That doesn't affect your responsibility. Evaluate risks. Well, why do we need to evaluate risks? How does this help the business? First of all, if you can properly evaluate risks, you can properly evaluate premiums, your profits will be more stable. Stockholders like stable profits. Second, it can improve pricing. If you can find a group of individuals who are better drivers than average, for example, you can offer them a discount. If you do that, if, you, if they're 10% cheaper than an average driver, you offer them a 5% discount, they're better off, you're better off. It's win-win. And every other company in the area starts losing market share, which they don't win, but you don't care so much. leading to competitive advantage. And this goes back to one of the very first projects I was involved with, the very first company. Uh, it was actually the second project I was assigned was to create an address parser. The first company I worked for had great data, but they had lousy address parsing. You can't imagine how many different sorts of addresses there. They start with a number. They start with a number of single digit, no letter. Boulevard, Street, ST, BLVD, RFD. Turned out I was the only one in the office who had listened to country music. I knew what RFD meant that we all free delivery. You know. um, zip codes. First, oh, and we had last, first and last names. First and last names without initials. First and last names with initials. Pre you know, prefixes, Mr., Mrs., Doctor. Postfixes, Junior, Senior, one, two, three. 
this was this was the departure was a months long process. And it was something I was very proud of, but it wasn't a whole lot of fun. But the model that it led to was what we were doing with this was sending our data to a company called TransUnion. How many of you have heard of TransUnion? Okay, a few of you. It's a credit scoring company. Uh, the other ones I think are Experian and Remember. Anyway, the idea was that if someone was more responsible with their credit, then maybe they would be more responsible with their driving. It's a, it was a theory. We wanted to explore it. So, oops, I forgot to the blank there. That's all right. I can do that here. Do that in a different color, however. So this is what I said to myself, and managed to convince a few other important people, was that credit score is probably only going to be so useful. <coughs> Very good credit scores, there's probably not going to be much difference in driving experience. People with poor credit scores, they may be lousy drivers, but again, there's only so much credit can probably tell you. So I said, what we probably want is a curve that looks something like this. It's got a nice little asymptote at the bottom, a nice little asymptote at the top, and you know the, the breadth of the inner slope. Now, this was purely a guess on my part. I mean, yes, I had data that sort of matched it, but there was a lot of noise involved. That said, it turned out to be a pretty good model, and it's still in use in the company uh, last time I checked. And the form of the function I actually used, not that it's particularly pertinent, was an arctangent uh, function. And basically, it was set up so there were four parameters. And I won't go into the exact form of the formula, but the top, the, uh, top asymptote the bottom asymptote, the uh, center of the curve, you might call it, and then sort of the slope towards the center. Now, of course, in retrospect, how did this blow up? <laughs> All right, well, more importantly, I have not been fond of this tablet. I like my Lenovo. Oh dear. So you don't always get to choose your hardware at the university either. Now, other things I could have done also, four parameter models. I could have made this a uh, logistic function, um, sort of a hyperbolic tangent, inverse. Uh, for that matter, I could have just said, all right, I'm going to pick two points. This would be horizontal to the left, right, horizontal to the left, and straight in between. I just happened to pick the tan inverse. And like I said, it wasn't bad. There's no, I, you know, at the time, like I said, it was my first project. I was still relatively new. I didn't have you know, a good grasp on you know, testing alternative models, finding out, does this really improve over another? What's simplest? But it worked. Use Excel's curve fitting. Now, in America, there are generally two kinds of actuaries those who belong to the SOA and those who belong to the CAS. The SOA is the Society of Actuaries. And they focus typically on life policies. Those are, you know, when a person dies that provides for their family. 
annuity policies, which used to be uh, something that would provide income over time, perhaps a thousand a month until death. Uh, now, because uh, people have gotten into investing, insurance companies have tried to get into that as well, and they've designed what are known as variable annuities, which are investment contracts with some interesting features. Uh, pensions, of course, um, Social Security being the, the example that many of you have heard of, uh, time was a lot of companies would offer defined benefit uh, pensions, meaning that the benefit was defined, hence the name defined benefit, and that would pay a certain amount per month for the number of years of experience you had based on your salary. Uh, nowadays, most private companies have gone to defined contribution plans. That's where they tell you what they're going to contribute. They define the contribution, and you're on your own to invest it and to make sure that it will last you the rest of your life. Uh, government still often uses defined pension, uh, defined benefit, and some of the larger union contracts, uh, like the UAW, I think, still use defined benefit. There are advantages and disadvantages to each. And then, of course, health insurance. The Casualty Actuarial Society focuses on property and casualty insurance, which includes home and auto insurance. Uh, I would assume that pretty much anyone in here who drives has an auto insurance policy. If you don't, don't tell me. <laughs> uh, home insurance. Then you've also got liability insurance, uh, corporate liability, professional liability, uh, individual. You know, if you someone slips on your sidewalk, Typically, there's an amount in your home insurance policy that's devoted to individual liability. You can buy an additional policy called an umbrella policy, which covers everything. I don't know why they came up with the name umbrella. And then workers' compensation. Um, one of my second job was at St. Paul Fire and Marine. It was a case where I arrived a month before they announced a 10% discount reduction. So I was there for four months, and then I got two months severance. 60 days notice, and uh, so you know I worked for four months and got four months paid vacation after they moved me across the country and then moved me to my next location. For having a job for four months and being let go for no good reason, I got treated darn well. <laughs> but uh, I actually worked in the specialty lines department, which basically reserving, and I'll talk a little about what that means later. But one of our policies with it was, was with an amusement park. And I can say that for a few months, I was involved with helping to insure a roller coaster. Now, let's see. Oh, that's where the blank slide went. That's what I wanted. I must have gotten the wrong spot. That happens. So, I want to talk a little about the mathematics, the difference between the SOA and the CAS. <coughs> Claim frequency. <coughs> if you've got an automobile policy, it's entirely possible that you could have two or three claims in a six month period. If you have a bad driver, you just have bad luck, right? If you have a life insurance policy, how many claims are you going to have on it? Just one. Just one. Very few exceptions. I think Lazarus might have gotten away with claiming twice. But other than that, <laughs> You're going to die once, only once. You're only going to have one claim. There's not much math there. One. Claim severity. If you've got an auto policy, you hit a telephone pole. You could do $500, $1,000 damage to your bumper. Maybe do enough damage to the telephone pole to make a little difference. What happens if you hit a school bus? All of a sudden, you've got a dozen parents who are thinking about suing you for a million dollars. The severity is very broad in casualty insurance. With one, with a life policy, well, uh, seven years back, I got a $200,000 uh, term life policy, which means that if I die, they know the severity. I'm going to be, pay, they're going to be paying out. $200,000. Now, 
Now, of course, if my underwriter had known what 2015 was going to be like for me, he would have had a heart attack, but <laughs> too soon. Now, the other factor to think about is investment interest. Again, a simple auto policy. In Indiana, these run for six months at a time. How much investment interest do you think you're going to earn in six months? Not much. You get money in. If you have to pay it out, on average, it's halfway through the policy, three months. For a life policy, if you write a life policy on a teenager who survives until age 90, you're talking about 75 years of interest. So the primary factor in casualty insurance are the frequency and severity of claims. Investment interest doesn't matter as much, although when you're dealing with some policies like asbestos litigation, they can drag out for years. But typically, casualty insurance cares more about the frequency and the severity of claims. With a life policy, frequency and severity are known. If it's a term policy, it's either zero or one. And the face amounts are defined. But the investment interest plays a big part. So with this in mind, where do you think health insurance fits? Claim frequency is the health insurance claim very well known or very highly variable? Is an individual person going to have, you know, is it possible they have zero claims and then three claims and then two claims? Yeah, it's highly variable. So I would tend to fit up with CAS. But what about the severity? Can health claims, they, they have a known amount, or are they, again, widely variable? You could have a couple of uh, prescriptions for antibiotics. You could have cancer. So they're highly variable. And how much investment income do you think you get on health insurance as an insurer? Not much. Typically, people are insured through work, which means that a portion of your paycheck goes to your health insurer, which means if you're paid every month, the company that insures you gets on average two weeks of investment income. If you're paid bi-weekly, twice a month, they get an average of one week. So there's investment interest is a minuscule factor in health insurance. So go back. You'll notice that health insurance is under the aegis of the SOA, not the CAS. Why do you think that might be? Any ideas? Because when the systems were created, they didn't yet account for that. They just put them in categories when they were like. You're a little bit on the right track. They knew about the mathematics, but it turns out that people are a lot more comfortable talking about health problems with the same agent that they're talking about issues with their life insurance and retirement planning. They don't necessarily want to talk about the prostate with the person that's writing a policy on their car. Got a carburetor problem, and I got this little issue in here. <laughs> Bum ticker both ways. So, health insurance, from a mathematical standpoint, fits much more closely with the Casualty Actuarial Society, but it's traditionally been included with the Society of Actuaries. Most companies tend to focus on one branch or the other. Most actuaries, as a result, focus on one branch or the other. Um, a lot of times, once you start a track, that's the track you will spend your entire career on. I was very fortunate in that after St. Paul, I got one of the five um, possible jobs that a recruiters presented to me. One of them, out of the five, was a Conseco health company. The other four were casualty. And so I saw that as my opportunity to be very rare and have the opportunity to learn both tracks. And that's why I switched. So. 
what do actuaries do? Well, obviously, at least probably obviously, they work on pricing. They're the ones who determine how much you have to pay for car insurance. They're the ones who determine if you've had an accident, how much is your car insurance going to go up. Now, reserving is a little more complicated to explain. Um, and again, I will go with my life insurance policy. I was rated as standard seven years ago. Now, uh, had I exercised, lost weight, uh, in the next couple of years, I could have actually asked to be re-underwritten uh, as, as preferred, meaning healthier than average. Uh, that's pretty much gone out the window at this point, of course. But uh, my payment doesn't change for 20 years. But my probability of death, even if I were reasonably healthy, would increase each year. But if you take the probability of death times the value of the policy and add a little bit of interest and pay that each year, what's going to happen is rates are going to increase astronomically. People don't like that. People don't like wondering, well, why is my rate going up? I survived, didn't I? So in practice, insurers calculate what the present value of the insurance would be if you pay the same amount each year. And they calculate the present value of your cost as it's increasing. So in practice, you actually pay more at the beginning of an insurance contract than you're really costing the company. And you pay less later. So in order to account for that, the difference, or at least a portion of the difference, is set aside as a reserve for later. Uh, another example of reserve, if they hear about an accident, they might say, all right, well, it looks like this will cost us $4,000. But we haven't actually cut the check yet, so we need to set aside $4,000 for this person's accident. And that's on the books as a liability. Product design and development. Uh, obviously, actuaries work with marketing on this. It's been said that if you leave an actuary alone to design a product, they will design the perfect product for other actuaries. Not necessarily for the general population. But uh, questions include what features to include, what they might cost. And if you include a feature that's an option, what kind of people are likely to select that? What kind of people are not likely to select that? And how can you account for the fact that people are probably going to act in their own best interests? Research. Uh, there is research available. Um, it's obviously not as broad as academia. But uh, I've done a, a fair share of projects just looking at data we have, saying, okay, well, this is what I think our, our heart attack and cancer costs really ought to be. Uh, I told you about some of the projects that I've done. Those would qualify as research. They, I devised the methodology from the ground up. And investments. Uh, one large reason for actually being involved with investments is to reduce or even eliminate interest rate risk. Uh, those of you in Math 373, we're going to be starting Chapter 11, which talks about duration and convexity soon. This is actually a measure of interest rate risk for a stream of cash flows. If a company prices a life insurance policy, assuming that it'll earn 6% a year, and then interest rates drop and they're only earning 4%, they're on the hook for a lot of the difference. So the idea is to try to invest so that whether interest rates go up or down, the assets and the liabilities move in the same direction by about the same amount. Insurance companies aren't there to try and make a mint by investing. Insurance companies are not there to gamble on interest rate risks. Insurance companies are intended to actually try to eliminate those risks as best as possible, make a profit by taking a reasonable cut off the top and providing good service. So, how do you become an actuary at IUPUI? First of all, this is a, since my exam time, uh, they've created what they call the DEE section, subjects that are validated by educational experience. 
the idea behind this is that they've decided rather than them testing these subjects, they think that colleges and universities can do a better job of teaching it. So they've monitored a bunch of courses in a bunch of different schools and said, all right, these courses are acceptable if the student gets at least a B or whatever the standard is. Now, that said, if you get through school without having taken these subjects, there are private organizations who offer courses. So you, can, you're, you're, you still have the opportunity to um, get your BEE credits, even if you don't take the courses here. Um, applied statistical methods, uh, either the sequence of STAT 512 and 520. 512 is time series, I don't remember 520. And then I think the 570, 574 is econometrics, but I'm not sure. I'm not involved with these courses, so if you see something wrong, do feel free to correct me. 520 is time series, 512 is regression. Oh, 512 is regression, 520 is time series? Yes. I stand corrected. Corporate finance, uh, there's a few tour courses taught in the business school that are currently approved. And then uh, both micro and macroeconomics. Uh, e is again econ economics, S, maybe social studies, I'm not sure. It's on these courses. Oh, okay. Yes. Thank you. So it's expected that you will have taken at least most of these courses by the time you graduate. Um, And then you've got the SLA and CAS exams. Now, one thing that's nice about a career as an actuary is it's one of the few careers I know of where you can get a raise by passing a multiple choice exam. <laughs> the low level SLA and CAS exams are mostly the same. There are four or five, depending on who you ask. Uh, the SOA and CAS nomenclature is slightly different. Um, I'm not going to go through all the differences, but suffice it to say, the first one is probability, and that covers the material in STAT 416, and then I do a problem solving seminar, STAT 371. I like to say that if you take 416, you learn the formulas. When you take 371, you learn to understand probability. That's just my opinion. Um, I, I'm, really big on thinking about the problem, understanding it, being able to draw a picture. Never do, never use calculus when you can get away with using basic algebra and geometry. The second one, and this one is uh, newly offered or encouraged to freshmen, is the financial mathematics interest theory. If uh, I tell you that I'm willing to pay everyone in this room a million dollars, you might get excited. If I tell you that I'm going to do that by paying you a dollar for a year for a million years, you're probably going to be somewhat less excited. <laughs> Pricing annuities is one of the first things we learn in Chapter 3. Uh, we talk about bonds, mortgages, and of course we start off by just the idea of interest in seven or eight different ways that has been described historically. This is also the course where you learn one very important thing about actuarial science. Mathematics is a language. Actuarial science is an unusual dialect in the sense that this isn't the dialect that Isaac Newton used to calculate the motion of the planets so that the king's fortune tellers could provide more accurate horoscopes. This was a language developed by business people for business people. Modeling life contingencies and modeling financial economics. These basically combine probability and interest theory in different ways. Life contingencies, talks about life insurance, annuities, pricing, reserving. And then modeling financial economics actually looks at models for the stock market, the Black-Scholes uh, model for call and put options, for example. Now, what most people are shocked by is that what they learn in school has very little to do with what they're actually doing on the job on a day-to-day basis, day -day basis. It is important that you know the material. It's important that you be able to talk about and discuss it intelligently. But on a day-to-day -day basis, the most important thing that you will need on your job is being able to work a computer. Spreadsheets, typically Microsoft Excel. Some companies use Lotus, which is that's good. 
and then a language that teaches you database management, typically SQL or SAS. Another thing that surprises people, when you're in a classroom, you sit in front, you, you take your test, you don't look up. In the business world, you need to work with people. You need to be able to communicate with other actuaries, with people above and below you, and even non-mathematicians. I kid you not. You need to be able to simplify mathematical concepts. And then last but not least, you actually need to learn some basic rhetorical skills. See, it turns out that actuaries are usually right. And I noticed that a few of you are laughing because I didn't provide, even though my conclusion was correct, I didn't provide you with a good argument that would convince you based on your assumptions, did I? I didn't use rhetorical skills. So, rather than looking at what's interesting in the fifth decimal plate of of one particular cell, you've got to focus on the big picture. Now that sounds weird, focus on the big picture. But recognize what's important to your client, whether that's someone else in the company or someone in a different company. So, what's in it for you? Well, the world's always going to need insurance. And I say that because the world has always had insurance. Even before computers, think about it, small rural farming community. You've got a barn burns down. Everyone else pitches in to help build a backup. A farmer has an accident. The other people around spend a few day, hours after their chores helping to take care of the feed the cattle, work with the crops. This is social insurance. This is your friends and neighbors. Everyone's chipping in. Everyone's willing to put a little bit extra in so that if it's your turn, well, you're going to be okay. Uh, apparently, there are even records of Roman centurions who created a widows who created a widows and orphans fund. And as a matter of fact, how many of you are familiar with the story of uh, Pharaoh's dream in Genesis 41? Very good. How many of you have heard of the Broadway smash musical Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat? Got a few more takers on that. The book was better. In the story, Pharaoh asks Joseph to interpret a dream in which seven fat cows are grazing by the river, and then seven thin cows come up and eat them. And Joseph explains that this is going to lead to the dream means that there are going to be seven years of good crops followed by seven years of famine. And so what he tells Pharaoh to do is, during the good years, what we need to do is set aside one-fifth of the crops in storehouses so that when the famine comes, we're ready and we've got extra. This is why Joseph is now known as the world's first preserving actuary. Second, I would be remiss if I lied, it pays well. It pays well, especially if you get to the point where you've passed your exams. Um, management potential. If you've got good people skills, you've got the opportunity to work with people later. You can, you know, a lot of the uh, actuaries of Conseco are uh, VPs because they, they started out low and rose through the ranks. It's entirely possible. Some people can get to management just based on technical skills. However, it really does help having people skills as well. Geographic flexibility. Locally. Big companies include One America, Conseco, WellPoint, uh, among consultants, Milliman has an office, and there are probably a dozen other, at least a dozen other, smaller companies. But most markets in the United States have an actual presence. Um, some of the smaller cities might only be one or two companies, and there are a few oddballs, like Iowa. Um, Sioux City has quite a few actuaries, quite a few companies are based there. But uh, you know, more, more commonly, you've got Boston, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles. I've got a student who actually works in Los Angeles. I've got another one in DC. So it's not to say that moving is, is never easy, necessarily. But you've got a lot of choices if uh, you want to either stay here or if you don't want to stay here. 
even internationally, I, I'm, I'm not big on the, I don't know much about the international market, but suffice to say, there are opportunities in Europe, Asia. And, of course, there's always the possibility that you can come back and teach. <coughs> so, what do you need to do in order to get a job? One thing I think that is not emphasized enough is passing exams early in your career. The reason I, early in your college career. Uh, the reason I say that is because passing exams is what will typically lead to getting a summer internship. And if you've proven that you can work at a company, show up on time, not dress like a slob, that you have basic computer skills, can make connections, you can get references for future jobs, you can get a foot in the door. So if you really need to try to get an internship by at least your junior year, if not your sophomore year, and most internships do require passing at least one actual exam. Uh, there are opportunities for grad students as well, obviously, um, but typically companies prefer that it not be the summer after you graduate. I'm not entirely sure why, but that just seems how it is. The other advantage of getting an internship is if you don't like it, you've wasted a summer. You haven't wasted a career. You can, you've got time to find something else. So, it's cheaper, in my opinion, to take the BE courses here than to pay an outside company to do it after you've graduated. That said, I can't say I've looked into the dollar amount, so I could be wrong. But that's my advice. Take some of my courses. Um, try to get some internships, look at the VEE courses. So, where can you get a job? Obviously, insurance companies. That's where my experience has come from, for most of it. Consultants, the people who work with insurance companies on projects that are too difficult or the company is too small. Regulators, these are people that work to make sure that financial reports are accurate, that people aren't being taken advantage of. It's not like insurance companies try to take advantage of people, generally speaking, but the regulators, you know, as the saying goes, locks were invented to help honest people stay honest. That's the role the regulators serve. Investment companies, other financial companies, and my most recent job in Cambridge was actually, help, I was the loan actuary to health services provider. They had nurses who spoke well, I think every nurse on staff was bilingual. Um, they had at least 13 different languages represented. And they served, they basically took money from Medicare. Uh, the government, instead of sending the Medicare check to the individual, they would send it to the company, Senior Whole Health. And Senior Whole Health would provide medical services. The idea being to try to help people stay out of the nursing home, which saved the government money. The people were happier because they got to stay in their home. And Senior Whole Health got a nice cut. So it was win, win, win. So really, companies in general that need to manage risk and can afford to hire specialists are good opportunities for actuaries. So any additional questions? Uh, SOA.org. I believe these websites are right. I didn't check CASAC.org. And then that's BNActuary.org. It's not like www.LimaBNActuary.org. And then, of course, Kelly and myself. So, any questions? So, who should go an actuary and who should? Who should become an actuary? Someone who wants to work in the real world. Someone who's good at math. Uh, but someone who wants to see it applied for the purpose. Some, someone who's more interested in seeing it used uh, rather than doing deep research uh, to be published in journals. I don't, I'm saying journal writing, certainly, you know, people who publish papers in journals make a difference. But as an actuary, I can, you know, when I was an actuary, I could tell you what I did last week. As a teacher, I think that many of you are going to be making a difference 10 years from now. If I'd written in journals, I could say, you know, my, the paper I published, this work will be interesting and useful. 20, 50 years down the road, maybe. When I was an actuary, I could say this is how I made a difference last week. Um, you have to be able to 
not just understand mathematics on a theoretical level. You have to be able to apply it to real world. I, I, in my courses, I, I talk in translating English to mathematics and back. That's important. You have to understand not just the equations. You have to understand what's going on. And is it fine for people to go this field after they got their master or even like PhD degree? I got it. I I did my PhD in operations research. The only way I became a, the only reason I became an actuary is I had a roommate who was really obnoxious. I said, Bill, you should sign up for actuarial exams. Bill, you'd like taking the actual exams. You'd love the material. Bill, you'd be really good at this. Bill, and he wasn't the first person suggesting. He just wouldn't shut up. <laughs> Two and a half weeks before the exams, I finally signed up, and that was when I discovered, to my horror, that I did the first half of probability and statistics several times but not the applied statistics portion of it. So most of the two and a half weeks, I spent teaching myself everything about ANOVA and, uh, analysis of variance and autoregressive and integrated moving averages. And I forgot most of the latter half because I never used it. Um, the operations research exam I, was easy to ace because that was my PhD. Uh, numerical methods has always been a hobby of mine. I would flip through the book and say, OK, yeah, I know that. Yeah, I taught myself that. Yeah, I invented something better. Yeah, you know, just mm -hmm. that was easy. Um, but but the applied, getting a 10 on the applied statistics was uh, something I was proud of because that was not easy. I don't recommend starting to study for an actuarial exam two and a half weeks beforehand. Trust me. But yeah, I just fell into it. Uh, now that said, in my day, it was possible to get a job um, if you just tried an exam and not necessarily passed it. Nowadays, because you know, 20 years, it, it's been one of the top careers for 20 years but very highly rated, so as a result, entry level is a lot more competitive. You need to show a little bit more commitment and a lot more promise with regard to passing exams. But uh, yeah, if, if you've passed, if, if you're working on your master's or your PhD, you look at the material, you take a couple exams, you, you've certainly got a reasonable shot at uh, making it throughout.